Welcome to The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. Today, we're going to talk about ideas and the power of ideas. You're just one idea away from having everything that you want. And you have had so many amazing ideas that you've ignored, that have slipped by. And there are some things in your life, I promise, that you would love to have some new ideas about. Ideas are the very focal point of imagination. And as we've discussed on this podcast, imagination creates reality and imagination is God. How can we generate new ideas? How can we take advantage of the power of ideas? The best money spent is the money spent to cultivate the genius of your own mind and spirit. One of my favorite motivational speakers ever was Jim Rohn. He mentored Tony Robbins and he was really amazing in the discussion of how to create ideas and use them for success. As he said, hear or read something challenging, something instructional, at least 30 minutes a day, every day. You can get along without meals, but you can't get along without some ideas, examples, and inspiration. He would say that most people are just trying to get through the day. He wanted to learn how to get from the day. Every day is a piece of the mosaic of your life. You need to capture the experience, the knowledge, the sights, the sounds, the panorama, the color and the emotions so they will serve you for the future. If you want your life to change, here's the source of it all. Ideas plus inspiration. The good news is ideas are not that far away. There's an excellent phrase for you to consider, one that will serve you well for the rest of your life. Everything you need is within reach. Everything. The ideas you need for life change or business change are within listening reach. They are within reading reach. In fact, there's probably a library not too far from you. The problem is most people pass by libraries. Very few walk in. Andrew Carnegie set up all these libraries across the country thinking everybody would stop in, but almost everybody drives right on by. I went to the library the other day here in Orange County, and I was the only one in that library. Do you know how many people own a library card in the United States? 3%. And they cost nothing. My greatest advantage is that I simply read, while many people do not. And if you want to give yourself an amazing advantage in your life, start to read. It will be the one generator of ideas. Ideas are within reach. But here's the key question. Who is going to reach? There's a simple biblical phrase that says, if you seek, you will find. But it's very important to know that finding is reserved for the seekers. We don't find what we need. We find what we search for. If you will search... If you will try, if you'll go, if you'll listen, ideas are within reach. And ideas are life-changing. There's nothing so powerful as an idea whose time has come. A business idea, a social idea, an investment idea, a good health idea. All you need is a specific idea to make an impact on your life. Ideas can help you gather treasure gather equity, and gather wealth. Ten years from now, you can be right where you are now, or you can be in a new place. The difference between now and then could be significant in terms of money, lifestyle, treasure, and equity. In ten years, you can enjoy an incredible life. If right here and now, you make a small change in your thinking to start you on the journey. The key is to start right now 
gathering the ideas and making the changes that will take you further along the new road. Ideas can change your life. And sometimes all you need is just one more good idea in a series of good ideas. It's like dialing the numbers of a combination lock. After you've dialed five or six numbers, the lock may not come open. But you probably don't need five or six more numbers. Maybe you need just one more number, one more idea. Maybe a seminar or a sermon or YouTube episode can provide it. The lyrics from a song can do it. The dialogue from a movie could do it. Conversation with a friend might do it. If you keep your eyes and ears open, you will find that one last idea you need is everywhere. A lot of times, people are being given inspiration all the time, and they simply never notice it. Their mind and eyes are closed even though they are seemingly open. Once you find that idea, the lock comes open and there's the door for you to walk through. Just one more idea. No matter where you get it, maybe all you need to open the door of opportunity. If, however, the lock still doesn't open, you may be lacking in inspiration Who knows why some people are inspired and some are not. Some people find a great idea and turn it down. Some people say that it costs too much. Some people say that it's going to take too much time. Some people are too busy. There are a lot of different reasons why some people are inspired to take advantage of a good idea, while others just pass it up. I think it is the mystery of the mind and we'll just leave it at that there are some things we can't figure out some people buy and some people don't some go for it and some don't some change and some don't and if you've been around for a while you can usually spot those who don't take advantage of a good idea a man asks how come all this stuff goes wrong for me It's easy for us to say, I don't know, beats me. The most I've been able to figure out is that those kinds of things always happen to people like you. I'll bet he's one of the ones who won't take advantage of good ideas. If he continues on that path, he'll probably never find the right combination. That honor will always fall on the ones who do, like you. I know Just at the beginning of this podcast, you have already remembered a number of amazing ideas that you've had that you didn't take action on, that you let flitter in your mind. The constant, disciplined, purposeful, constant search for knowledge. It's where the life-changing ideas are. Pursue knowledge with high expectations. Spend the money, time, and effort. They are all investments. But the payoff is so great, it's hard to compare the cost to the reward. First is the money. I have a great suggestion. Set up an educational fund for the programs. The books, the lectures, the seminars, and the videos you need for a constant flow of ideas and inspiration. Take a portion of your income each month and set it aside to invest in the search for knowledge. Remember, the best money spent is the money spent to cultivate the genius of your own mind and spirit. Make sure you don't spend more for frivolous comforts and conveniences than you do for education. The money is a small price. The promise is unlimited potential. The next investment is time, which is an extremely valuable expenditure. It's one thing to ask someone for their money, but to ask them for their time is a much more significant request. Knowledge takes time, precious time. The time you spend is irreplaceable. You can get more money, but you can't get more time. However, life has a unique way of rewarding high investment with high return. The major investment of time you're making now 
could be the small fine tuning that you need for a major accomplishment. Last is the investment of effort. There's a great deal of difference between casual learning and serious learning. Learning that opens up the whole mental and spiritual process is truly an investment in effort. And this effort is the investment that opens the floodgates of ideas that can work their magic for you in the marketplace. So I'm not going to hesitate to ask you to spend in a deliberate and conscious fashion the money, time, and effort required to reach your goals. These are the investments that turn on the lights, sharpen the focus, and start turning your wishes of wealth and happiness into reality. Let me share with you two of the best sources of information available. First, there are your own experiences. Become a good student of your own life. It's the information you are most familiar with and feel the strongest about. So make your own life one of your most important studies. In studying your own life, be sure to study the negative as well as the positive, your failures as well as your successes. Our so-called failures serve us well when they teach us valuable information. They frequently are better teachers than our successes. One of the ways we learn how to do something right is simply by doing it wrong. Doing it wrong is a great school for learning. But I'd suggest that you not take too long doing this. If you've done something wrong for 10 years, I wouldn't suggest taking another run at another 10. But what a close at hand and excellent way to learn from your own experiences. Jim Rohn talks about meeting someone named Mr. Schof, who had been working for six years. He started when he was 19, and that was when Mr. Rohn met him. He was 25 at the time. He said, Mr. Rohn, Mr. Rohn, you've been working now for six years. How are you doing? And Jim Rohn said, not very well. He then said to Jim Rohn, then I suggest you not do that anymore. Six years is long enough to operate with the wrong plan. Next, he asked Jim Rohn, how much money have you saved in the last six years? Mr. Rohn said, not any. He said, who sold you on that plan six years ago? What a fantastic question. Where did Mr. Rohn get his current plan that wasn't working well? Everyone has bought someone's plan. The question is whose? Whose plan have you bought? Right now, you have a plan. Is it your plan? Is it someone else's? Has it been failing? Have you been failing? You can change your plan. Those initial confrontations may be a little painful at first, especially if you've made as many errors as I have. But think of the progress you can make when you finally confront those errors by becoming a better student of your own life. The second way to learn is from other people's experiences. Remember, you can learn from other people, whether you've done things right or wrong. You can learn from the negative as well as the positive. The Bible is such a great book because it is a collection of human stories representing both sides of the ledger. Some human stories are called examples, do what these people did. Other human stories are called warnings. Don't do what these people did. What a wealth of information knowing what to do and what not to do. If your story ever gets in somebody's book, make sure they use it as an example, not a warning. There are three ways to learn from other people. The first is to listen to the programs and read the books by and about people who have accomplished great things. You don't have to believe entirely in them but look at what they've accomplished so all the successful people around the world are good readers everyone i've ever met is a good reader they just read all the time they are driven to read because they just have to know it is one of the things they all have in common successful people listen to audiobooks while they're in their car or during times when they can't read. These programs can help us all easily pick up new ideas and skills. There are programs and books on how to be strong, more decisive, to become a better speaker, a more effective leader, have a better effect on other people, become more loving, develop a winning personality, to get rich, 
develop persuasive influence, become sophisticated. And so many people don't utilize these resources. Why is that? There is so much information out there that you can acquire that will tell you exactly what you need to do in whatever field it is that you want to do. So why aren't we reading these books? These books are sitting states you can enter into, autobiographies, so many different ways of learning. There are hundreds of successful people that have written their stories in books and told the world how they became successful. And most people don't want to read or listen to them. Why is that? How would you explain that? They're busy, I guess. They say if you worked where I work, you'd know that by the time I struggle home, it's too late. I gotta have a bite to eat, watch a little TV and go to bed. I can't stay up half the night and read all the time. I just don't have time to read, I hear, all the time. I listen to about three books a week just from the books I listen to when I'm at the gym. And I only am at the gym for 45 minutes to an hour, five to six days a week. So if I listen to just a book, whatever book it is, I knock it out. Now, I'm reading all the time, but you have so much more time than you can imagine. Imagine someone who's behind on their bills. He's, he's a good worker and he's sincere. Unfortunately, you can be sincere and work hard all your life and be completely broke confused and embarrassed you got to be better than just a good worker you've got to be a good reader and a good listener you don't have to read or listen to educational programs half the night although if you're broke it's a good place to start all you need are just 30 minutes a day that's what Jim Rohn recommends that is a good starting point 30 minutes a day that's all. Stretch it to an hour if you can, but set aside at least 30 minutes a day. Hear or read something challenging, something instructional, at least 30 minutes a day, every day. Miss a meal, but do not miss your 30 minutes. You can get along without some meals, but you can't get along without some ideas, examples, and inspiration, as Jim Rohn says. There's a biblical phrase that says men cannot live on bread alone. The most important thing aside from bread is words. Words nourish the mind. Words nourish the soul. Humans have to have food and words to be healthy and prosperous. Make sure you have a good diet of words every day. And remember that to properly feed the mind, you must maintain good balance. Don't just read or listen to to the easy material you can't live on mental candy with good books and programs you can tap into the treasure house of ideas if somebody has a good excuse for not tapping into the treasure house of ideas for at least 30 minutes every day please tell me i'd like to hear the reason you wouldn't believe some of the excuses that i've heard i could say hey john i've got this gold mine I've got so much gold, I don't know what to do with it all. Come over and dig. And John says, I don't have a shovel. And I say, well, John, let's, let's get you one. And he says, don't you know what they want for shovels these days? John has the wrong perspective. Don't make the same mistake. Invest the money. Get the programs and books, the best money you can spend is money invested in your self-education. Don't shortchange yourself when it comes to investing in your own better future. We all need a good library. Here's one of the books that I recommend to start with, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Doesn't that title intrigue you? Think and Grow Rich. Who wouldn't need that book? You can listen to it on my channel or you can read it. You can find it in a used bookstore, probably pay less than 50 cents for it. You can start this process of developing a library like I did. 
Here's a mindset guide to you as you begin. Your library needs to show that you're a serious student of life, health, spirituality, culture, uniqueness, sophistication, economics, prosperity, productivity, sales, management, skills, and values of all kinds. Let your library show that you're a serious student. And I like physical books. When I finish a book, I have it right there. And I remember the book. Just it's an experience that's sitting on my shelf. Your library will become your mental food, your food for thought. It's so important to nourish the mind, not just the body. You've got to be educated. A good book to start with is How to Read a Book by Mortimer Adler. Adler was a chief editor of the Encyclopedia Britannica, which is also a good set of books to have in your library. In How to Read a Book, Adler gives you some good suggestions on how to not just read a book, but actually get the most information out of it. He also provides a list of the best books ever written, and I have definitely used that as a centerpiece for my own library. I'm just telling you what works. If it suits you, fine. If it doesn't suit you, keep looking around until you find something that does suit you, just to be sure to keep your library well balanced. Let's give some examples. Number one, we got to have a sense of history. We need to know about American history, international history, family history, and political history. This sort of knowledge will illustrate for you that the state of one's life rarely changes for the better of its own accord. Once you realize the next logical step is to realize that you have to do the changing. History helps us to understand that there is to work with seed, soil, sunshine, rain. It also tells us what human beings have done with those resources in the past to change their lot in life. You'll find that many of them transformed from non-productive citizens to productive ones. That's what history is for, to learn the lessons of our ancestors, be a good student of history, and don't be afraid of history that for some way demeans you because of your ethnic heritage. Don't cut yourself short. The next crucial topic is philosophy. You might find it a little bit difficult to comprehend some aspects of philosophy, but you can't just read and study the easy stuff. Don't be afraid to tackle the hard, difficult to comprehend stuff. That's how you grow as a person. Next, there's novels. They don't all have to be nonfiction. Many times an intriguing story is interwoven with the philosophy that author is trying to get across. There are so many great books out there that you can read. One of my favorites is Sean Tarum. That is a powerful story of an escaped convict trying to start a new life in India. And there's just so many little lessons that come from it. I would skip the trash. Sometimes you can find something valuable in a trashy novel, but I wouldn't take the time to read something too trashy. You can always find a crust of bread in the garbage bag. There's just not enough time to waste your time because there's so much brilliant stuff out there. The next big thing in your library should be biographies and autobiographies. You can read the dramatic stories of both good people and terrible people. You need to understand the balance between good and evil. Get a book on Gandhi and get a book on Hitler. One will illustrate the heights of a good a human being can accomplish, and the other will illustrate how low and despicable a human being can become. You need to comprehend both sides of the coin. Next, if you can find books on accounting, then I recommend it. You've got to have at least a, a primary understanding of accounting. Kids have got to start learning the difference between a debit and a credit. The next is law. You don't have to be a lawyer, but you've got to know contracts, what to sign, what not to sign, how to be safe rather than sorry. All of us need a little law, especially in these complicated times. You've got to build a library that shows you're a serious student of personal development in all areas. So begin with a few books. Soon you'll open up a whole new world of fresh ideas. You encounter a plethora of ideas when you do this, and you'll encounter them every day, but most of them probably go by unnoticed. 
That's why you need to develop the ability to absorb ideas. Be like a sponge. Don't miss anything. Don't miss the words. Don't miss the atmosphere. Don't miss the color. Don't miss the scenario. Don't miss what's going on. Most people are just trying to get through the day. Here's what I want for you to be committed to doing. Learn to get from the day. Learn from it. Let the day teach you. Attend the University of Life. What a difference that will make in your future. Commit yourself to learning. Commit yourself to absorbing. I know many people that are gifted in this area. They soak up and remember virtually everything that has ever happened to them. They can tell you vivid stories from their teenage years, where they were, what they did, what they said, how they felt, the color of the sky, and what was going on that day. And the reason is because they absorb everything that happens to them. I have not reached that point, but I look up to them to try to reach them someday. Here's a good phrase for you to jot down. Wherever you are, be there. Be there to absorb it. Take a picture if you can. Take pictures in your mind. Let your soul and heart take pictures. Get it. Capture it. Absorb it. And don't be casual in getting it. Casualness leads to casualties. Next, learn to respond. Responding means letting life touch you. Don't let it kill you. But let it touch you. Let sad things make you sad. Let happy things make you happy. Give in to the emotion. Let the feelings strike you. Our emotions need to be as acknowledged as our intellect. It's important to know how to feel. It's important to know how to respond. It's important to let life in, to let it touch you. I just love movies. I really get into good movies. I'm obsessed with movies. It's something my dad brought me. We would watch movies all the time. I want movies that make me laugh, cry, that scare me, that teach me something, take me higher, even take me lower. I just won't, don't want to leave a movie in the same condition as I came in. And these movies can do the same thing. That's what we all need to have life touch us. That's exactly what will happen to you when you develop the ability to absorb and respond to all life has to offer. In talking about ideas, we have to talk about keeping a journal. And if you're serious about becoming a wealthy, powerful, sophisticated, healthy, influential, cultured, and unique individual, keep a journal. Don't trust your memory. When you listen to something valuable, write it down. When you come across something important, write it down. I used to take notes on pieces of paper and torn off corners and backs of old envelopes. Actually, I still do. I wrote ideas on restaurant placemats and long sheets and narrow sheets and little sheets and pieces of paper. But really the best way to organize those ideas is to keep a journal. I've been keeping journals for a long time now. I have stacks of them in my office. The discipline makes up a valuable part of my own learning. And the journals are a valuable part of my library. So I love to buy blank books because I know I'm going to fill them. And it's amazing. You buy a blank book with blank pages for 15 bucks. Can you put down ideas in that to cover the 15 bucks and challenge yourself in that empty book? Can I do something with it to fill it up to make it worth more than what I paid for it? Keeping a journal is so important. I think it's one of the three treasures that we can leave behind as well that we can leave behind for our kids and our family. The first, of course, is pictures. Take a lot of pictures. Don't, don't be lazy in capturing the event. How long does it take to capture an event? One picture, fraction of a second. When you're gone, they'll keep the memories alive. The second treasure is your library. This is a library that taught you, that instructed you, that helped you defend your ideals. It helped you develop a philosophy. It helped you become wealthy, powerful, healthy, sophisticated, and unique. It may have helped you conquer some disease. It may have helped you conquer poverty. It may have caused you to walk away from the ghetto. Your library, the books that instructed you, fed your mind and fed your soul is one of the greatest gifts that you can leave behind. Every book is a stepping stone out of the darkness into the light. And then the final treasure is really the journals. 
the ideas that you picked up, the information that you meticulously gathered. Journal writing is one of the greatest indications that you are serious. Taking pictures, that's pretty easy. Buying a book at a bookstore, that's easy, but it's challenging to be a student. You are your own future and your own destiny. Take the time to keep notes and keep a journal. You'll be so glad that you did. What a treasure to leave behind when you go. What a treasure to enjoy today. One of the keys to making the most of ideas is developing the ability to reflect. Reflect means to go back over, to study again. Go back over your notes. Go back over your thoughts. And go back over your day. There are some particularly good times to reflect. One is at the end of the day. Take a few minutes to go back over the day. Whom did you see? What did they say? What happened? How did you feel? What went on? By answering those questions, you capture the day. Every day represents a piece of the mosaic of your life. You need to capture the experience, the knowledge, the sights, the sounds, the panorama, the color, and the emotion, so it will serve you well for the future because within those experiences are ideas that will change your life. Don't ever miss a day. Take a few hours at the end of the week to reflect. Go back over your calendar. Go back over your appointment book. Ask yourself the same questions. Where did you go? Who do you see? How did you feel? What went on? Capture that week. A week is a fairly substantial chunk of time. Take a half day at the end of the month to reflect on your month. Follow the same process. Go back over what you read. Go back over what you heard. Go back over what you saw. Sometimes going back over the things that have happened and the ideas that you've been exposed to is all it takes. Take a weekend at the end of the year to establish the the year. Go back and look over the ideas and things that have entered your consciousness over the year. The Old Testament describes a unique scenario that unfolded according to the law. At that time, people worked for nine years and the 10th year was a sabbatical. That 10th year was probably used for relaxing, replenishing, getting in shape physically. We would call it a change of pace in modern society, but that was not the only objective for the 10th year. I'm sure that in ancient days, sabbaticals were used to go over the previous nine years to see what went right and what went wrong, what worked well and what didn't work well. People would ask themselves, how did I grow? How did I learn? How did I change? What do I have now after nine years that I didn't have at the beginning? The time for reflection is what makes a sabbatical so effective and meaningful. At times, you'll want to reflect with somebody else. A husband and wife can reflect on the past year together. Parents can reflect with their children. Colleagues can reflect with each other. But you've also got to learn to reflect by yourself. Solitude is a powerful force. We all need to find some occasions to shut out the rest of the world for a while. I've got a motorhome and a motorcycle. That's how I find solitude. I head for the mountains and ride the trails where there are very few human beings. Or go out into the desert somewhere. It's time to get away. When you live in a very public life, your treasure solitude. When I have a chance to reflect alone, I go back over my life. Go back over my skills. Go back over my experiences. There are some things you need to do alone. Such as ponder, think, wonder, read, study, and absorb new ideas. Decide how you can become better this year than you were last year. Enjoy your solitude. Life is full of experiences, touching and seeing and looking and doing and acting. But you're going to lose the lessons of those experiences if you don't take the time to reflect. We can all learn to gather up the past and invest in the future. Gather up today and invest in in tomorrow. Gather up this week and invest it in this next week. Gather up this year and invest it in next year. Many people seem to be just hanging on. They don't reflect on what has happened in the past. They're just hanging on. We can learn to gather up the past and invest in the future. We can do this. This is a major part of your success, whatever it is. You can become better than you are now. Sometimes the best ideas can be found in the creative depths of your own mind. 
These ideas are often reluctant to make an appearance on their own. So how do you bring them out? You need to develop the ability to brainstorm. What is brainstorming? It's just what it sounds like. You let your mind wander. You free yourself from all inhibitions, objections, and negative thoughts. You just put an idea into your brain and let it take off. You engage in free association. Instead of planning a train or thought, you think freely. If you are planning a brainstorming session with your colleagues, let me give you a little hint. Effective brainstorming can only happen if you dissociate from your ego. You can't be worried about saying something stupid or silly or totally off the wall. Your silly thought may trigger someone else's brain to take it one step further. Brainstorming in a group is an experience of collective thought. It's an experience of developing one idea or several ideas through a variety of thought processes. Here is another hint on brainstorming. It can't be effective unless everyone involved is comfortable with each other. If you don't feel comfortable within the group, you may withhold the very thought that provides the solution to your problem. You may withhold it because you don't want to appear stupid. How do you think all the advertisements that you see on TV and on social media are created? How do you think some of those crazy campaigns are born? The process happens through hours and hours of creative brainstorming. Every member of a team jots down notes and one idea builds on another and another and another. And pretty soon a strategy is born out of the collective thoughts of a group. I don't believe the best decisions are made by committee, but great ideas are often created by committees. That's why the mastermind is so effective. Whether you're letting your brain go by itself or whether you're part of a group, brainstorming can often lead you to a solution, ones you would never have thought of if it had imposed parameters on your thought processes. If you are brainstorming on your own, envision outlandish solutions. Get your brain out of its rut by considering ideas without considering their practicality. If you allow yourself to think without confinement, you may come across a solution that seems totally inappropriate, but this approach will allow you to open up the process which will eventually lead to an appropriate solution. Another creative technique for generating ideas is through doodling. Doodling may be something you got in trouble for in grade school, but it's actually quite stimulating to the brain. The way you think while doodling is quite different than the way you think while creating a flowchart or writing a formula. Your doodles may end up looking like a symbol that triggers your brain to think of an alternative solution. Drawing creative doodles wakes up a different part of your brain, and once you awaken that creative part of you, whether it's through group brainstorming or doodling, you'll be amazed at the ideas you'll trigger from the recesses of your mind. Those ideas were always there but you never have known how to access them. Once you understand your own potential, this unlimited source is yours for the asking. There are unlimited ideas available to you. And if you open yourself up to your imagination, a portion of your day, allowing your mind to race and fly through the several ideas that you have and you write them down, you develop them, you share them, you build upon them, that is accessing the imagination. If all you're doing is just simply letting life come to you, but you're not going into your mind and listening to the thoughts that come into your mind, analyzing them, you're given ideas on a regular basis every single day. And these ideas can be powerful. I promise you, I know that many of you listening have had huge ideas that you didn't jump on, that you saw later on, Perhaps some of you imagined Google or the Apple computer or Microsoft well before any of that stuff came about, but you just let that idea float through your mind and you didn't take advantage of it. And you are a gold mine running through your mind all the time are gold mine ideas, ideas that are coming to you all the time and they're powerful. One single idea can transform or even start a brand new business. One idea. So sometimes you just sit there and you just ignore your thoughts or you don't think they're important. Becoming the neutral observer of your thoughts is helpful. When you do this, there are certain lines of thought that 
you become aware of that you can sort of stop and you open your mind up to a freer expression of the ideas within. But become creative. Creativity brings about new thoughts. So the challenge that I have made before on other episodes that I make now is try to create something every day, something new. Scribble a little picture, create a new recipe for food, think of a new song or a poem, draw a beautiful picture or paint something, whatever, but just do something every single day. Don't go to bed without creating something new. You can create something new in it within a second, but when you do that, you start to innovate the interior mental architecture of your mind into a creative state. And within the creative state, new states can form and bless you in so many ways. We are the new earth and we are the ones that will change this universe and this world and we will only change it with new ideas. Every idea is precious. Treat them as such. Don't ignore them. As we become closer to source, as we move into fourth density, you will find yourself racing with new ideas. Your mind will become more complex and you'll be getting more and more ideas every day. So carry your journal. If you don't like to journal, just put it in your notes on your phone, whatever you can think of. But let these ideas come to you and you could be the newest innovator, the newest creator. You might have a new idea for a website or a new song. I promise you that you are all amazing because within you, in that imagination is the universal mind of God. So why not wander through the imagination because it's like speaking directly with God when you do. You are one idea away from all your dreams coming true. And so I want you to start to really go after your ideas. Let them blossom. Garden your mind so that you get rid of the weeds and allow new wonderful ideas to sprout. And I want you to share with me your technique for creating new ideas. What do you do to get new ideas? Do you go for a walk? Do you journal? What is it that you do that gets your mind into that creative state where new ideas come that inspires you? I want to know what you do. Please share it with me. Put it in the comments. I might come back and read some of your examples in a future episode because I learned so much from the people that comment on my videos. Put a like on this so we can inspire others to really think about the ideas that they need to have in their life. You can find all episodes of The Reality Revolution at therealityrevolution.com. And welcome to The Reality Revolution.